good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight we are going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to get some answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We're opening up our lines now. We welcome you to that conversation tonight. 877-731-6733. We have a lot to cover tonight. Let's get right to it. Joining us from the University of Nebraska Omaha, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor and world-renowned doctor. We also welcome Nebraska Education Commissioner, Dr. Matt Bloomstead. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview review. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? Yeah, Christina. So uh, unfortunately, I'm starting to sound a bit like a broken record, but COVID-19 continues to spread widely across the United States and particular concern is uh, across rural America. If we start to look at some of the graphics together, uh, you can see that we're just over 9.2 million confirmed cases uh, yesterday, there were 74,000 confirmed cases in the U.S. On Friday, it was just under 100,000 cases, 99,700 cases, which is up almost 50 percent, 45 percent over the last 14-day period. And tragically, the number of deaths seems to vary between 400 and 1,200 a day, averaging out just under 1,000 deaths a day. But if we look at the map of America on the next graphic, you can see very clearly that what was originally a left coast and a right coast, uh, are of our large coastal cities, is now widely affecting rural Nebraska, particularly in states such as North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, Colorado, etc. You know, I think it, our graphics show uh, that of the top five states, uh, that the rate uh, per 100,000 varies from as high as uh, 137 per 100,000 per day, which is several fold higher than the peak uh, that was seen in New York City during the top of the pandemic era there, uh, to as high as uh, 50, 60, 70 uh, per 100,000 per day. And unfortunately, what is Ill happening at the same time is that hospitalization rates continue to rise. You know, if you look at this curve, you see the number of new cases per day. And unfortunately, that is translated into changes in hospital occupancy. Recent calculations have shown that we're up 46 percent over the last 14 day period in hospitalizations. And that is translated into older individuals, more patients in intensive care units. And sadly, as our next graphic shows, uh, the number of deaths remains very, very fixed across America, uh, as I say, varying at an average of just under 1,000 deaths per day for the last three months, four months, uh, et cetera. Unfortunately, though, with this recent surge due to changes in weather, pandemic fatigue, and all sorts of other factors that we can unpack later in the show, uh, these numbers of hospitalizations continue to rise with doubling times as short as 14 days, and unfortunately, that will translate into more fatality over a short period of time in the future. Wow. So an awful lot of time to stay laser focused on the important factors that we have in our control. Although there's so many distractions out there right now, including a big one, the election happening tomorrow. Dr. Gold, regardless of the outcome, no matter who wins, your message for stopping the spread remains unchanged. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, Christina. And first of all, let's just start off by saying everybody needs to express our democratic rights and vote. And uh, the pandemic should not stop that, whether you have voted by mail through early balloting or whether you're going to line up socially distance with your mask uh, tomorrow and vote. Uh, we need to express our, uh, our democratic rights. However, uh, I think to the point of your question, Christina, Nothing is going to change. The same things that are going to protect us today are going to continue to protect us tomorrow, no matter when we know the results of this election and for the foreseeable future. Obviously, we're working very hard on vaccines that are under development 
and we're going to get them out and get them into our communities, particularly the most vulnerable uh, in the near future. However, until that becomes available, all of the important aspects of increasing ventilation, social distancing, use of a mask that covers our nose and mouth, all of the things that we do with hand sanitizers, etc., are going to be increasingly important as the community spread continues to grow. So all things considered, it's the same, same it's the similar, if not identical factors that are going to protect us as we move forward, no matter what happens tomorrow, next week, or next year. You know, we've had a lot of new information, a lot of new case studies that have, we've been able to do them because kids, for example, have been back in school for the past couple months. We know what meat packing plans, we're getting those up and running again, and we have had some great success stories. Let's focus in on the academic side for a moment because we do have Dr. Bloomstead with us. In terms of academic success, how would you grade the overall state of education in Nebraska and around the country right now relative to before the pandemic, because we have had to make some sacrifices. Yeah, we, we definitely have worked very, very hard to ensure the best of the quality of uh, education that we can across Nebraska. And I'm sure the same is true across the nation. But it, we are suffering from the, the challenge that we're ultimately going to have as far as um, meeting the needs of every student. We have some students in remote, some in a kind of a hybrid environment that are there part of the week. Uh, the challenge that we really face in education is keeping them engaged. But even more important is keeping everyone safe and keeping that ability to stay in school is actually uh, quite important as well. And so uh, our school leaders, our, our teachers across the country are doing, I think, remarkable work of trying to address all these things. It's a very challenging environment, as we all know. But continuing to, continuing to really think about the importance of keeping uh, community spread at bay is, is critical right now so we can keep students in schools and keep them engaged in their learning as best possible. Absolutely. It's so important right now to keep kids engaged, keep them focused, because after all, their minds right now are vulnerable. They're at that critical learning stage. You've got to get these habits set now. So I, I, I don't envy the position that you've been in, Dr. Bloomstead, but I do. I'm really, really proud of the job you've done in Nebraska. It's a model for all of us across the country. 877-731-6733. Now it's time for you to join the conversation. 877-731-6733. 733 is the number to call with your questions for our experts. Our first call tonight comes from Charleston, Arkansas. Let's listen. I would like to take the flu shot, but I am very allergic to neosporin. Are there any flu shots that do not have neosporin in them? Thank you. So it's a great question, Christina, because it turns out that there actually are several vaccines that are uh, mixed with antibiotics, and neosporin, neomycin, and others are not uncommon uh, to be admixed uh, with what are known as excipients, or those things that the vaccine is actually mixed with. So uh, the advice that I would give you, sir, is pretty simple, is uh, get a hold of your local healthcare professional that offers you your vaccine, and every one of the vaccines has all of the products that they're prepared with listed on the label. And there are some that have antibiotics and some that don't. There are some that have neosporin and neomycin uh, mixed in with them and some that don't. What the antibiotics do is they prolong the shelf life of the vaccine, and so that's obviously an important thing to do. Uh, if, you're, if you're manufacturing large quantities of vaccines. And by the way, the same thing may very well be true when the COVID vaccines come out. And so you're going to want to ask your healthcare professional that exact same question. All right. Thank you so much for that call. Our next question comes from Dennis in Montana. He says, we live in the Whitefish area, and I'm wondering how it's going with kids going back to school. Is that part of the reason for the spread in rural America right now? Yeah, certainly as students have gone back into school, it's been really important that, that they continue to 
um, practice all those those safe uh, protocols within our school settings to make sure that we don't end up uh, with a lot of spread within our within our school settings. And here in Nebraska, at least, we're not seeing that there's a lot of that spread, but we are seeing the the community spread happen. And I think I think what people need to be cautious about is those very same protocols that are working in our schools to keep students uh, there in classrooms uh, need to be practiced in in families and in the community at large. So wearing masks and keeping social distance and understanding, you know, really where you've been and who you've had contact with. We've we've seen protocols change across the board for how schools are, are functioning, and we we've really worked to improve whatever protocols are in place. So when students are eating lunch, they're doing it in cohorts and keeping a distance, using plexiglass barriers and other things to, to really knock that down. But what we've seen in numbers, I actually believe is somewhat more, and certainly what we've seen in Nebraska, is somewhat more based on the behaviors of people when they're going to events and realizing and thinking that schools are normal, and it's not normal right now. They're working very, very hard to keep that safe, and we have to be equally, working equally as hard across our communities to do that work. All right, thank you so much. We appreciate that question. Next up is Teresa of California. She says, I watch the show from Kern County, and my question is, how long does immunity last? If I had this virus in March of 2020, could I get it again in March of 2021? Teresa, so, so the, uh, the answer is uh, highly unlikely. Uh, so we know that antibodies last somewhere between three and six months, which means that you can measure in some of our new antibody tests presence of very specific so-called neutralizing antibodies to COVID-19. But we also know that even as your antibody levels will slowly fall after you're infected, your white cells, your T cells, and your B cells will memorize what the COVID-19 virus looks like, the so-called SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it'll maintain the ability to manufacture antibodies. No different than when uh, you and I were children, we probably received measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, so-called MMR cocktails, diphtheria vaccines, and others. And while it may have to be boosted from time to time, we do have that amnestic response. The only disclaimer to my answer is that if the virus were to continue to mutate and if it were to mutate and change its genetic material significantly over the period of time of a year, such that the, the, the antibodies that we have, or for that matter, even the vaccines that we're currently using would no longer be effective, then you theoretically could get it again. And there have been some reported and confirm cases, unfortunately, of individuals that have been reinfected. But those numbers are extremely small, and they're almost all due to a significant genetic shift of the virus. And the virus has continued to genetically shift since we first started identifying it uh, back in the winter of uh, you know last year. However, uh, those genetic shifts have been relatively minor for the most part, and so the vaccines and your antibodies, you know, given the fact that you were infected, should continue to be useful to you. So good news. Okay. Now, you know, whether you think you've had it or not, what are the signs that, that come on that you really need to get yourself to the hospital as soon as possible? What are the big warning signs? I know you are in the work of saving lives, and this might just help somebody out there tonight, Dr. Gold. Sure. So the early signs are, you know, typically reported as uh, loss of sense of smell or taste, uh, congestion, sore throat, headache, fever. Those are pretty routine signs. You see them for influenza. You see them for common cold viruses, etc. But what really starts to become the tip off is when you become short of breath. So one of the things that we recommend to our patients when they're tested, particularly if they're older, particularly if they have underlying heart disease or they have uh, pulmonary disease or they're being treated for cancer or they're on a lot of other different medications for diabetes or high blood pressure, we recommend they get one of those little finger oximeters. They're typically available over the counter in pharmacies or you know, through any number of online stores. Uh, they don't cost very much. You do have to put a battery in them to make sure that they work. But we recommend that people do check their pulse oximetry. And the reason we do is because it typically will fall with COVID, 
you know, nor the normal levels are somewhere above 95 percent. Most y younger people are 97 to 99 percent saturated with oxygen. But it, when it falls below 95, gets to 93, 92, that's when it's time to be concerned enough to call your local health care professional or your local emergency room. Because when you get to about the, the low 90s or even 90 or even 89, that's when it starts to get really critical. And one of the things we've learned about COVID is that people are not aware of it till it gets critically low. And once that happens, the bottom falls out. And then you're calling 911 and it becomes a, you know, what we call a fire drill of crisis. And that's exactly what we want to prevent. And so being a very tuned into your body, being aware of even minor shortness of breath, and sometimes the way that's manifested, Christina, is just, uh, you know, you climb a flight of stairs that you've climbed a thousand times before in your life, and all of a sudden you get to the top and you're winded, and you've never felt that way before. That's an early warning sign that it's time to call for help. Okay, and pulse oximeter, like you were talking about, I see it right here. They're available on Amazon, Walgreens for about 15 to $30. So thank you so much. That's yep. a new key for a lot of us, a new tool. I'm going to make sure I get one of those. Dr. Bloom said... And don't forget to put the battery in, Christina. <laughs> that's, that's key. <laughs> he knows me. Dr. Bloomstead, <laughs> you've worked closely with UNMC on safety measures to keep students safe throughout the pandemic and get them back into the classroom. This has been a learning experiment on some level. What have you learned that's working and what was not working? Yeah, and just even before I dive into that one, Dr. Gold, just what he just said is what he told me because my dad just tested positive for COVID. And so um, everyone has those types of questions. And a lot of our work with UNMC is asking the types of questions that we have across schools and, and trying to find different ways that we can help uh, kind of communicate, uh, you know, the best practices and review data and make sure that if we're seeing challenges that we improve those practices. Um, I think I'm on meetings at least twice a week on, on big uh, uh, Zoom uh, video conference calls with uh, experts from UNMC and from all of our local public health officials across the state. And, and really having that access to that information is really important. And, and it's a challenging time for us. It's really important that we find ways that we can move forward uh, kind of together. And again, we learned that with our partnership with UNMC. Wow, you know, you just you just dropped a little bit of a bomb on us telling us that your dad has COVID. Let's explore that a little bit further if we can. Uh, how long has he had it? How is he doing? Well, he, he seems to be doing fine so far. Um, certainly, uh, he's had it for a little less than a week, and we're still uh, trying to monitor. I'm calling him. He lives quite a bit away. He lives in rural Nebraska in a very small community of uh, 350 people or so, um, 30 miles at least from a critical access hospital. Um, just kind of knowing what those those signs are is really important. And, you know, he honestly just ended up contracting it by kind of dropping his guard. He's been careful, but he he uh, met with a, a cousin and uh, spent time together with them and ended up contracting the virus that fashion. So wow. so again, it can happen to anyone. And, and it's important to kind of keep 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 your guard up when you're when you're following these procedures. And, you know, just just because people really take your guidance to heart, what did you tell him? What are the warning signs that he needs to look out for and eventually get himself to a hospital? Yeah, it, and again, because of the concerns of how far it is, in fact, it's just what Dr. Gold had said. I, you know, I've asked him to pay attention to his breathing and his ability to, to uh, kind of uh, do those normal activities. Uh, he's feeling, for the most part, pretty good, but I said over the next few days, certainly what the information looks like, that when it, gets, takes, it could take a turn for the worse, and I actually appreciate the oximeter uh, um, advice that Dr. Gold provides because... Um, being that far away from from healthcare is really uh, a challenge and a concern for me as a as a son um, being so far away from my father. God bless your dad. We wish him well. We are going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. We still have time to get your question in eight seven 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 three one six seven three three. Thank you for your patience. Those who are waiting on the line, we're going to have more of your questions, more rural health matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. 
Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold. Tonight, we also welcome Nebraska Education Commissioner Dr. Matt Bloomstead. Our next question comes from Delilah of Kentucky, and she says, My college-age grandkids would like to come home for the farm for the holidays. Do you know if a vaccine for seniors will be available by Thanksgiving or Christmas? Yeah, so I doubt highly that you would have access to a widely available vaccine by Thanksgiving. There is some chance that it will be available to you by Christmas. There is a possibility, Delilah, that depending on where you live, you might have access to one of the clinical trials that's ongoing in the United States with one of the warp speed vaccines that the Department of, uh, Home, of Health and Human Services has been developing with the pharmaceutical industries. But if you participate in a clinical trial, you won't know uh, whether or not you received vaccine or you received a placebo. And so uh, unless uh, you are sure that you receive vaccine and you have a reasonable period of time, because most of these vaccines are going to take two doses, uh, they're going to be three to four weeks apart. So as we get closer and closer to the holidays, uh, I would say the chance of this actually happening in a way that can protect you in a reasonable level uh, from college age transmission is getting uh, vanishingly small. I know uh, that's the advice we're giving our communities here. And I'm guessing if you were to talk to your local public health people, uh, you'd get pretty much the same answers. All right. Thank you, Delilah. Really appreciate that question. Next up is Ryan of Wyoming. He says, my dad is farming in his 80s and healthy. But when we go to town, he has a hard time breathing and even talking when he wears a cloth mask. Can you recommend a more breathable material? Well, among the cloth masks, Ryan, there are many different types. Some are multiply, some are single layers of cloth. Obviously, the thicker the mask, the more protection you're going to get out of it for your dad. However, some mask is better than no mask, and you really don't want him to be uncomfortable because there's some risk uh, associated with that. You know, if he's in otherwise good shape and he's farming, he should be able to tolerate a routine cloth mask or a paper mask. So I would try a number of different types. Some of it may actually just be the fit of the mask, and my recommendation would be is, uh, uh, you know, when he's home uh, watching TV or, or, or with friends, uh, hopefully with friends and, that are socially distanced, let him be sure to wear the mask and spend some time getting used to it. Because for some people, it's just that they're not used to it. And it just takes getting accommodated to the feeling of have your, having your face wrapped in a piece of cloth. You know, as uh, someone who practiced surgery for 25 years of my life, I've been used to that feeling for a very long time, and so it's not a strange feeling to me. But for people who've never done it, I'm sure it's a very foreign sensation, and it gives you the feeling of being sort of penned in and claustrophobic. But you do get used to it. And so I would say try a few different types of masks and uh, let them try to get used to it for short periods of time at home, and hopefully uh, that'll solve the problem. All right. Thank you so much for that question. We really appreciate it. Next up is Bill of Wisconsin, and he says, we have a dairy operation, and my wife and I wonder how long we will have to be the on-call teachers for our kids. Will it be the case throughout next year? Well, I, don't, I can start, and then we'll get uh, Commissioner Bloomstead's thoughts on this. His uh, best answer to the question is we don't know. Uh, a lot depends on the availability of vaccines. A lot depends on not only what vaccines are available and shipped. You know, logistics is always a big question. But, you know, there's a good deal of skepticism and concern in many of our communities uh, about whether or not they're going to be the first in line to get vaccinated. And I think a lot's going to depend on the confidence that the American physicians and nurses and pharmacists have in prescribing these vaccines uh, when they first become available. However, the best answer to your question is uh, I think we're going to, you know, I can tell you we're here at the University of Nebraska system. We are planning the spring semester and we're planning it to look exactly like the fall semester looks. No changes. We are hoping to get the vaccines out and get them widely deployed, but we're anticipating that spring's going to look like fall. What are we thinking K-12, Matt? 
Yeah, and it, it's actually very much the same for us um, across the K-12 space. And one of the challenges ultimately is that we're able to um, stay in school largely uh, with protocols that are in place. And so um, I'm hearing across Nebraska, we'll have places that really have fought, and, uh, fought off the mask uh, requirements within schools, said this isn't necessarily a, a real issue for you know, perhaps younger kids, but it is a real issue um, across the board. And what's going to keep us in school are all those different protocols, but we need community support uh, for those protocols as well. And within the community, we need to make sure that we're following those those same types of protocols and, and, and protections for uh, spreading this virus. And so I guess what I would say, and, and uh, I, I think it'll be largely the same going in, certainly at least to the, the rest of this school year and possibly even into the fall that we're going to have to be extremely cautious. Um, really supporting those environments in schools, those protocols in schools, are, are that's part of the battle. And doing the same things across the community is going to what uh, is going to be what keeps us going in school. So you won't always have to be the substitute teacher, but um, the the reality is it's time it's time for us to be able to to follow those procedures. And the better we do that, the more likely we can keep kids in school. All right. Next up, we're going to go to Wyoming to speak with Hannah. Thanks for joining the conversation, Hannah. Go right ahead. Well, it's Anna, not Hannah, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about My that. My question was how, how they feel about what the plastic shields that even some people in the health care community as, are wearing. And uh, for the person particularly who is having trouble breathing with a mask, are the plastic face shields as uh, as safe as a uh, mask? That's my question. And, uh, you know, uh, we do believe that the plastic face shields add safety to those who are wearing masks. However, they do not provide the same degree of safety as a cloth mask, a paper mask, or certainly as an N95 respirator. What we've learned is that the virus is not only transmitted through our mouth and through our nose, but also through the contact surfaces of our eyes, what we call it conjunctival spread. And that's where the face shield or protective glasses or goggles uh, do make a difference in our healthcare care uh, facilities. Now, if you can't wear a mask for one reason or another, the face shields are certainly better than nothing, but the masks are safer than the face shields. So face shield plus mask, best. Mask alone, better than face shield. Face shield alone, better than nothing. All right. And you know that because the airlines often say a face shield can be worn, but with a mask. You can't just have the actual shield without the mask. That's what the airlines say. You know, I have a question about Halloween because there were a lot of Halloween gatherings. Some were big this year. Are you expecting a spike after some of those Halloween gatherings? And if someone did contract the virus on the 31st, when would they most likely show symptoms? So, unfortunately, uh, Christina, we are going to see an impact of Halloween. We're going to see an impact of trick-or-treating with, you know, school-aged children and adult Halloween parties. And uh, the uh, answer to the question is uh, somewhere between three and seven days uh, is the typical spread until you start to see symptoms. But unfortunately, let's not forget, a lot of the uh, revelers that celebrated Halloween are in the younger age groups. So they're going to have a very high percentage of being either minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. We know that among school-age children and college-age children, uh, <clears throat> that uh, young adults, of course, 40% uh, uh, of them will have minimal or no symptoms and be highly infectious with COVID. And so uh, we're looking forward to those same statistics, unfortunately, uh, due, to, uh, due to the Halloween gatherings which, you know, gives me a chance now to talk to our audience a bit about planning Thanksgiving. You know, I think, as I may have said previously on the show, that in our family, Thanksgiving is the most celebrated holiday. It's when all the generations get together with the great-grandparents and the grandparents, etc., and we celebrate the family. But we're not going to do it this year. As sad it is for me to say that, and as traditional as it has always been in our family now for more than 40 years of marriage, with wonderful parents and grandparents, uh, we just can't do it. It's just not going to be safe. So this would be a good time for families to talk about virtual gatherings. You know, use uh, social media, use FaceTime, 
use other ways of bringing your family together. But we know that meals are the highest risk for spread. Even in communities that have rigid mask mandates, when you take your mask off, you break bread, you share beverages, you chat with your loved ones and your family, and even those who may not be quite so loved in, uh, in your family, uh, uh, <laughs> that's when the spread really is at highest risk. And so let's take this time as we get closer to the Thanksgiving holidays and not use it as an excuse to spread the virus. That's right. I like how you put that as well. We all have families, Dr. Gold. We all know how that works. Now, when we well, talk about- I love all of mine, so <laughs> I'm in good shape. I do too, I do too. In fact, that's what makes the holidays more fun. Everybody's got their own personality. They all come together. When you talk about Thanksgiving being a factor, what about Christmas? Because I know for a lot of our vulnerable population, they're really hoping to be able to get that vaccine so that they can get together with their family by Christmas time. What are the, the odds there? What's the likelihood? So uh, I think I may have mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that uh, last week I spent a few days in Washington, D.C., meeting with some of the leaders in the vaccine development programs. And indeed, we are enrolled in several large uh, multinational clinical trials of the Warp Speed products and some of the others. Uh, first of all, the data coming back on some of the early trials, particularly on the Pfizer and the Moderna products, are looking quite favorable. Secondly, the expectation is the trials may be completed and the adequate amount of data collected in the next several weeks, hopefully by the end of November. And if the data can be analyzed by the end of November, there is a chance that we can start to see the vaccine products shipped in mid to late December. So it's really going to be a bit of a race as to what it's going to take. And the first of in the individuals who are going to be immunized are going to be the frontline healthcare workers, which is going to then be followed by the most vulnerable, which is the older individuals uh, and those that have comorbidities, those that have heart disease, those that have cancer, those that have diabetes or high blood pressure or other lung diseases. And so that's the rollout scheme that each of the states has put together in response to the federal mandates, in response to the National Academy of Medicine guidelines, uh, which are being used. And that's all pre-planned, all the logistics for shipment and administration of the vaccines theoretically are in place in every state in the United States right now. And so hopefully we're just waiting on the results of the clinical phase three trials, which uh, will hopefully be in our hands in the next several weeks. You know, there's no signal, uh, a single endpoint. And the reason for that is they have to wait till they see a significant difference between those that received the vaccine and those that got placebo. Okay. As we do wait on that vaccine, Dr. Bloomstead, do you think that cases will resurge to the point that we actually have to issue another national shutdown and bring students back home for schooling? Or are we going to get to a place, or do you believe we're already there, where we can just move forward with in-class education regardless of what happens with the numbers? Yeah, and I, I think part of the reality for us is that we've learned a lot more about the transmission of, this, of the disease and the virus overall. And it's really probably less about kind of a national type of uh, 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 decisions about where school's at, but much more localized and at a state level. And I get asked often by our school leaders in Nebraska, are you going to mandate uh, some type of closure? I think our bigger challenge right now is if community spread can get in check and we can do contact tracing and keep uh, staff in place in our schools, it's, it's possible to keep them open through this. But the, the ongoing challenge is obviously uh, we could be overwhelmed by the number of cases in any community, in any setting. And, and if you think of uh, schools very much like you would other businesses, if you have lost your workforce to be able to keep it open, it's going to be quite a challenge. So, so I think, uh, or at least hope, that the, the, the opportunity to have vaccine in place and other things give, give us a lot of hope about where we can go. But it's really all those non-pharmaceutical interventions, the social distancing and masking and everything else, that for the period of time, probably for this school year and maybe even into next, those are going to be the things that help keep us open. And we need widespread acceptance of those, of those measures in order to make a real difference.
Absolutely. Now, Dr. Gold, you were just touching on this a little bit, but I'd like to reach into Dr. Bloomstead's area of expertise for a moment because I've heard that there may be a link between COVID spread and school lunch settings. Can you elaborate on that a little bit mm. for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. It's actually what Dr. Gold uh, just just talked about. Uh, the the importance of uh, masking is really critical in the in the spread of the virus overall. But it is in times where you're sitting down to talk with other folks uh, kind of in close proximity and eating is one of those where it's a social event. Um, it tends to be in schools that they have, uh, you know, are trying to limit the, the proximity of students to one another, trying to do that. But in that setting, obviously students aren't wearing their masks um, because they're, they're obviously trying to eat. So, so uh, the challenge really has been um, watching for those things. We've actually, again, another opportunity we've had to work with UNMC is setting up protocols for lunchrooms, really being thoughtful about how students set. And, and you probably can't really see it, but there's a plexiglass barrier here that's becoming a pretty common uh, uh, theme within our within our overall uh, uh, opportunity. Yeah, there it is. So we're divided by the plexiglass. And the, uh, the, the reality is for kids in, in school settings, those types of dividers and other things are starting to become more commonplace. Certainly the distance between them is important. Obviously, our students need to be able to eat and, and uh, continue in that, but we're continuing getting better and better at those procedures as well, especially if we see any problems. I bet there's such a learning curve with the little ones, though. I'm just amazed what you've been able to do. Just amazing. Dr. Gold, what do we need to keep in mind when we do eat in public settings to try to keep ourselves and others around us safe? Yeah, so again, it comes down to density. It comes down to the precautions that the restaurants uh, and others have. Uh, you know, there's been just a lot of attention on our campuses, for instance, to grab-and-go food. Uh, and so we've really tried to limit the amount of seated uh, cafeteria-style uh, eating. Uh, we've really limited uh, the number of people that will sit at a given table uh, and how far apart they are and tried very, very hard uh, to increase airflow in those areas and do all of the table and, you know, con continuously sanitizing the tabletops and things along those lines to encourage people to use hand sanitizer all the time. And, you know, I'll, just, just to be really clear, because I want to reiterate this, because Commissioner Bloomstead said it, but I want to repeat it, that the overwhelming majority of spread that we see in our schools, be it students, staff, faculty, and others, is caused by community spread. It is not caused by spread in the schools. Indeed, uh, you know, I look at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, which is approximately 16,000 students, 5,000 faculty and staff, so think about it as an environment of about 20,000 people uh, who are uh, in college at one level or another. We've had just over 200 confirmed cases, but 85% of them, 85% are community acquired, and we've contact traced every single one of, of these cases. About 75% uh, or 80% are in students, the rest are in staff, and those that did occur on campus, which are few and far between, were either college roommates or were faculty and staff that ate together across the table. Just making the point that those moments that you're not wearing your mask, that you can't really social distance, that's when the vulnerability strikes. You think about it, 20,000 people working together and living together and studying together since the beginning of the semester, you know, the third week of August, those are astoundingly small numbers. And indeed, our schools and our campuses are frequently the safest places to be compared to what's really going on in community spread. So I think if we want to keep our schools, our K-12 schools, our universities open, it's what happens in the community that's really going to dictate that. All right. 877-731-6733 is the number to call in with your question. For our panel of experts, more rural health matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Right after this quick break, we still have time for your call. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold. Tonight, we also welcome Nebraska Education Commissioner Dr. Matt Bloomstead. We're going to go back to the phones now. Evelyn of Texas is up next. Thanks for joining us, Evelyn. Go right ahead. Yes, we have some good friends that have had the virus, and they've been over it, they say, now for about six weeks. They want to come visit us for the day. Is that safe for us to do that? Evelyn, uh, if they were tested and they were confirmed to have the virus at six weeks, they should have antibodies. And my best advice would be for them to go get their antibodies tested. And if they have immunity to the virus, I would say it is safe for you to visit with them. And, uh, and of course, the travel becomes comp important as well because you wouldn't want them exposed to other people to carry the virus uh, on their hands or et cetera. So they'll need to, uh, you know, wash carefully and, and take all the usual precautions. But their ability to uh, get reinfected and to transmit the virus to somebody else would be extremely low. All right. Thank you for that call, Evelyn. We appreciate that. That leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. Dr. Gold, do you have any idea how much closer we are at this point to reaching herd immunity? Uh, not a whole lot, unfortunately. Uh, I think we actually have a graphic that looks specifically uh, at the numbers uh, associated with herd immunity. But as I said earlier, we've got about 9.2 million confirmed cases in the United States. We would have to get to more than 20 times that, 197 million cases in the United States to get to, uh, and that's a very conservative estimate, to get to herd immunity. And we would ha that would mean over 3.6 million hospitalizations and at a case fatality rate of 0.6%, uh, that would mean 1.1 million deaths. Now, contrast that to where we are now. We're at about 230,000 deaths in the United States. So this would be five times as many people would die and 20 times as many cases. So for all of those reasons, herd immunity is really not a, uh, a solution that we are looking forward to, to embracing. Unfortunately, as the number of cases continues to rise, we do edge closer and closer to that number, but we're off by a factor of 20. So that's too big a deal, too long, too hard, too much hospitalization, and far too many deaths. Wow. You know, Dr. Bloomstead, substitute teachers are often retired, a little bit older, perhaps in that at-risk group, maybe less up-to-date as well with technology, and our kids have to, to work in, in a situation that's already trying. I'm wondering, has it been hard to get substitute teachers in this setting that you're working with right now where kids are in the classroom and out of the classroom as well, and are you having a hard time retaining teachers in some cases? Yeah, it's, it's been extremely difficult on schools to get their, their norm, normal substitute uh, teachers pool uh, organized in such a fashion that lets them uh, kind of maintain their normal operations. So teachers are very stressed in classrooms as sometimes they're having to cover more than one classroom at a given point in time. In Nebraska, uh, we've had some um, ability to extend uh, what we call local uh, substitute teacher um, uh, provisions the, to allow folks who might not have all of the uh, proper credentials, might have a four-year degree, but even in Nebraska, we allow even less than that for local subs. We've extended that. Uh, we continue to hear pretty much every day about concerns in Nebraska around being able to access those folks uh, on a regular basis. And you're, you're right, we've often uh, relied on retired teachers as uh, part of the substitute teacher pool, and, and they're folks that, that have uh, concerns about coming into the school environment to do that. What I will say also, like we talked about before, the uh, transmission of the virus within school seems to be very, very limited. And, and, and if all the procedures are followed, really a, a very safe environment. And so we've tried to encourage folks to understand those safety procedures, those precautions that are in place, and, and, and make a good judgment about it. But it is a challenge. We, I'm worried about what the future of uh, our teacher pool is overall, because it's been a very challenging year for teachers, not, not just in Nebraska, but I'm sure across the country.
And parents, and parents as well. I mean, what have we learned to improve the experience of distance learning, which is still an aspect of school for many kids, even now? Is there anything we can tell parents and grandparents out there who have kids who are still having trouble during distance learning? Yeah, one of the things is really build a good re rapport with the teachers that are part of that environment. I know teachers have worked very hard. We're getting better about scaling up some of the uh, educational uh, uh, lessons and other things in an online environment. Um, also getting better, I think, about kind of the technology, which is a learning curve for a, a lot of families and households as well. But one of the, I think, the real important things that we continue to do is think about how we can in improve that teacher practice. I I've seen some schools that actually set a, uh, are dedicated a number of teachers to do their kind of online learning environment instead of having to teach in a hybrid at the same moment in time. I think that's probably one of those things that we're learning to do a little bit better. Setting up resources in a different way to interact with parents is important. And I also think that it's not just sitting, you know, right there in front of a computer screen taking in uh, that information constantly. I've seen good practices been, been developed to say, uh, go explore something like in the household setting or otherwise to help students really uh, gather their, uh, you know, their opportunity to learn in, in different ways. And so we'll see improvements and continue to do so. But uh, it is a challenging environment. And again, patience between uh, teachers and parents and, and students, too, is really important. Absolutely. We all have to work together. Next up, Terry from Virginia has a question. Thanks for joining the conversation, Terry. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, Dr. Go. Uh, we certainly appreciate this program because it's been immensely benefit, been a, a, a benefit to all of us. Um, my wife and I are in our upper years. I'm 83 years old. And she's 79. Uh, but our son uh, lives in the uh, uh, eastern part of Pennsylvania, and he and his wife and two kids were planning on coming for Thanksgiving here. Uh, you you're said earlier that you had canceled your uh, uh, family get-together for Thanksgiving, and I was just wondering if, if the small number of people makes a difference in that uh, position of yours, or how would you suggest we go? Terry, uh, you know, as heartbreaking as what I'm about to say is, uh, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I think the combination of the age of your family members in eastern Pennsylvania, the travel that's going to be necessary, uh, uh, I, I just don't think it's worth it. You know, uh, there's nothing that I'd like more than to hug my grandchildren over the holidays. And, uh, and I just have to keep reminding myself that this is not going to last forever, that I'll have plenty of time to do this. And there's just too much risk, particularly, you know, uh, as you said, uh, you know, uh, by the way, uh, late 70s and early 80s is getting younger every day. Uh, but it's still in an age bracket that you and I both know that you need to be extra careful about your health, particularly as it relates to COVID. So I would say plan the holiday, plan to use electronic technology to have dinner together. Uh, maybe you'd share some of the things that you're going to be cooking and eating uh, maybe you'd share some stories and, and do some, uh, you know, outreach to your grandchildren and to your children and, and back and forth and try to make something extra special about it. Maybe you'd watch a movie together or play some games together, which you can easily do. I do that with my grandchildren all the time. I read stories to them online. But you can make the holiday special without taking that extra risk. And that would be my very best advice to you, sir. I love it. And I love the idea of having a FaceTime Thanksgiving dinner to, to bring the family together. What a great idea, Dr. Gold. We're going to go back to the phones. Mary from Kentucky is up next. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Go right ahead. Yes, I am 86 years old and I live close to my great grandchildren. I see them almost every day and they are four or five and 11. And how likely am I to get the virus from them? And they are in school. Yeah, Mary, so if you're seeing them every day, uh, you have been exposed to whatever they have and they've been exposed to whatever you have. Unfortunately, uh, if they're in school, they do run the risk of picking up the virus from another student, from a teacher, from a staff member, from a school bus driver. 
uh, for whatever it is that they may come in contact with. And unfortunately, uh, the young children in that age group can have the virus and most importantly can infect other people without ever getting sick, meaning no symptoms, no fever, no congestion, uh, no shortness of breath, no sore throat, none of those things, and yet uh, shed the virus. So I would say that uh, you really need to be super careful or maybe uh, for the next little bit until we have the vaccines available, which, you know, in your age group, you ought to sign up for just as soon as it does become available, uh, that maybe you want to not gather for the holidays and maybe you want to take a little extra precaution, particularly as the weather gets worse, <clears throat> gets colder, you're more indoors, ventilation is not as good. Uh, it's just adding to the risk in the community and adding to your risk. Okay, thank you for that call, Mary. We sure appreciate it. Okay, we have just a few moments left, and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit, bring it back to the election, because for a lot of rural Americans, voting on Election Day is tradition, and they're going to show up to their polling places tomorrow. What happens if you show up somewhere and you see that long line of people, you know you're going to stand in it anyways. What do we need to keep in mind, Dr. Gould, to keep ourselves and others safe? Uh, first of all, that thank you for going out and voting and reminding everybody that that's what makes our freedom and that empowers our democracy is the ability to vote. <clears throat> but we have to do it safely. I can tell you that I, we work very closely uh, with the Bureau of Elections uh, here in Nebraska, and there's just been an incredible amount of safety and training by the poll workers in terms of social distancing, in terms of sanitizing the surfaces, uh, in terms of the ma absolute mandate uh, for the use of face coverings. And so my advice is uh, keep your distance from all other people. Be sure to wear your mask. Uh, use a lot of hand sanitizer before and after uh, you vote. <clears throat> uh, when you get back to your home, uh, be sure to what I would recommend, uh, if you can, change your clothes, uh, wash them uh, carefully. Again, use another set of hand sanitizer. Wash your hands, not just for 20 seconds, but 40 seconds or 60 seconds. But please do go out and vote. It, it is the way we preserve and protect our democracy. Absolutely. And with that said, uh, there's a lot that could happen between tomorrow and Monday when we meet back here. Let's talk a little bit about our mental health, because we know that tensions have already been running high. We don't know what's going to happen, what the outcome will do, what it means for our country. So do you have any guidance for us, any advice on, on how we can keep our minds on mitigating the virus and, and on not letting our tensions run us right now, Dr. Gold? Well, there are a lot of tensions. And of course, we're referring now about the political tensions, but just the pandemic has caused tensions. The economic impact of the pandemic has caused tensions. The social isolation has caused tensions, and we spent a lot of time talking about some of the behavioral health things. You know, my best advice uh, for all is to just stay focused on your day-to-day -day life. Stay focused on those that you love and love you. Stay focused on your spirituality. You know, we all have an agenda of our day to be sure to stay well-nourished, get plenty of sleep, and, and do what you normally do uh, every day. We are gonna get through this pandemic. We're gonna emerge stronger and better. And similarly, whatever happens as a result of this election cycle, you know, in 1920, we were just coming out of the 1918 flu. Our soldiers were coming back from the First World War. We were going through a very difficult economic time, and we were facing what was referred to as the most important election in American presidential history. And guess what? We got through it and came out a stronger and better nation. And we are going to get through this together. Absolutely. We've got to hold on a little bit longer. And I really look forward to Monday night's show because we're going to have more great discussion, more of your calls. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Nebraska Educationer Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Matt Bloomstead. We really appreciate when you join us on the show. Now, if we did not get to your question tonight, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. Grab a pen or a pencil, 855-776-6147, and you can call at your convenience and leave your question on our voice machine. 
And remember, we'll see you back here every Monday at 6 Eastern, 5 Central for Rural Health Matters as long as the pandemic lasts. Wishing you and those you love a beautifully blessed evening.